What's up guys, it's Bronwyn from Empire Barbell. Today we're gonna to talk about the force versus length curve when it comes to evaluating muscle fibers. So this is something that most of you know intuitively, you've probably come across this in practice, but anytime we see something that we've learned the hard way out in the field and it gets validated by some type of academic study, it's one of the few times that the academic realm in this field does what it's supposed to do, and that's actually give us insight by providing some type of actionable information we can benefit from in the moment. But anyways, we're gonna take this and try and derive some meaningful principles we can follow, that we can put into practice, that are actually based off of some of this established work that has been done before. So the force length curve is going to cover how much force a muscle puts out based on its length. So what we find is this is a muscle very short and fully contracted. This is a muscle very stretched out. Basically what we find is that if a muscle is too contracted, so think of a bicep that's fully contracted, kind of starts to run into itself, right? You create more mechanical tension just by that, that space getting very, very crowded. So you're not very strong in that position. Likewise, when a muscle is very stretched out, a very stretched out muscle also is not very strong in that position. Now, most of the time we encounter that in training, but it's important to know that we're talking about just the length, we're not talking about mechanical advantages or disadvantages that go along with that. Usually in a lift, the point where the muscle is fully stretched is also the point where you're mechanically disadvantaged. What I mean by that, take the bottom of a bench press. As you come down, the pectoral stretches, but you're also moving horizontally farther away from the pivot point. So this moment arm is getting bigger where the load is being supported in your hand versus where the pivot point is. That's bad leverage. As that load gets closer and closer to the pivot point, leverage continues to increase. That's why we're always stronger closer to lockout where those joints are much closer to being completely open and stacked on top of each other because that's where leverage is optimized. So theoretically, we're trying to like remove the mechanical advantage, the leverage advantage from the discussion of what the muscle is doing. So just imagine for a second, bear with me, if you had your pec fully stretched and you were pushing against a force plate, and likewise, if you were right here, if you had your pec contracted, pushing against a force plate, and if somehow you can measure that contraction perpendicular to where your hand is, at every point during that step. Uh, cable fly will get you closer, but you actually need something that is directly perpendicular to where your hand is to get an idea of what's going on. So fully stretched out, we're very weak. Now, why is that? Uh, in the previous video, we went over how actin and myosin filaments form cross bridges to kind of grab and pull, grab and pull. Well, depending on where the muscle is, as far as being very short or very contracted, you're gonna get a certain percentage of overlap of those filaments. The more filaments that are overlapped, the stronger you're gonna be at the start. When you're very stretched out, those filaments are not overlapping very much. So you're in a weak starting position. Now, what you see as this goes on is it's what we call active tension, active force production. And that's from the, the action of those filaments doing their job and grabbing and sliding. We also have passive tension, which is created by, basically if you take all the slack out of a muscle, it's like a rope that's pulled tight. So it doesn't even matter if they're doing mechanically the job they're supposed to be doing, you take all the tension out of your pec, you have tension here. But that's just because it's basically hanging on itself. That's a different thing. So as passive tension goes up and up and up, basically you're pulling that muscle tighter and tighter, then you get this kind of rebound, you get a little assistance. Think of it like a slingshot, where the muscle is assisted now because it can rely on this passive tension. Now this is something that powerlifters love to exploit. Anytime you can arbitrarily increase the amount of tension or increase the amount of compression, in a system to move more weight without actually getting stronger, it's a powerlifter's best friend. So all of the tactics that are taken in to increase intra-abdominal pressure, by taking a deep breath and squeezing, it turns you into just a water balloon that's getting crushed and that extra compression helps create passive tension at the bottom. And some of the movements that powerlifters have taken to over the years have served only to increase passive tension by increasing tension in the muscles, so supporting you more at the bottom of a lift, and in their mind, increasing likelihood of success. Now there's sometimes where that's warranted and there's sometimes where it's not. Intuitively, you might think, okay, we don't go out of our way to lengthen a pectoral when we're benching. There's a good developmental response when we do that. It's a good way to grow it. But if you're trying to bench press as much as possible, having your pec stretched out as much as possible with a flared elbow and a wide grip, maybe not the best way to move it. Similarly, with a deadlift, you're not gonna go up to a bar, push your hips way back to try and stretch out your hamstrings in a bid to increase passive tension to try and help you off the ground because active tension would be so low at that point, you would be very, very weak. So in general, we tend to favor when the main movers are shortened. 
because they're gonna have more purchase at the start, which means more starting power, which means more momentum going through, which means a better, cleaner lift. That's in general. Now, the times where mechanical tension is warranted, and I gotta do a rather long Facebook discussion. If any of you come across me on Facebook, just imagine a 12 year old on Grand Theft Auto, so like you're not surprised. You don't expect me to be on my best behavior. Most of my Facebook arguments, I only jump in when I'm trying to like prove a point or correct somebody. And half the time it's for reckless entertainment. Half the time it's me having someone to argue with so I can kind of refine my ideas. Anyways, my biggest fear is that many people come across my Facebook posts because it's, it can be kind of a shit show. But I got into a rather long discussion about this with a guy who was insisting that stretching out the hamstrings, he was specifically talking about the adductors, put tension in the adductors, which made you stronger at the bottom of the squat. So the idea was you were stretching this muscle and then moving into that stretch to basically turn it into a trampoline. So there's this idea that you want to increase as much passive tension or just blind mechanical tension, compression, whatever you like, as you get into the bottom of the squat to optimize how much support you have and make the change of direction much easier. So anyone who bounces at the bottom of a squat does this. And even, even to a lesser extent, the guys that uh, have very wide, very controlled kind of forklift-like squats do this as well. The idea is to come down. At some point, the muscles contract isometrically and you turn them into makeshift trampolines. That's how a bounce occurs. Now, as a very kind of medium stance, high bar squatter, I stay very upright. The way my bounce occurs is I start to descend, my knees go forward, and I actually get a bounce by keeping my hips under me and pushing my knees forward and rocking back up. So mechanically, it's a little bit different than what, uh, let's say, a hip dominant squatter does. Lately, I've been trying to shift it more in my hips because you have a bigger joint, bigger muscles, It'll save my knees, but it's actually more powerful. It's just going to take me retooling it. But for the most part, even wide stance squatters, and uh, some Olympic lifters are pretty good at this as well, create tension at the bottom of a squat by basically pulling their, uh, their adductors are a big one. It's, it's kind of innervated by part of the nerve that innervates the hamstring, the adductor magnus, I think. So the idea is by pulling it tight, you create this mechanical tension so you can trampoline off of it at the bottom. So the way that looks, is if I'm descending in a squat, I have my knees out, I'm sitting back into my hips, bringing my knees out and sitting back is pulling that muscle tight. So by the time I get right here, I have all this passive tension from the muscle being pulled tight and I can essentially bounce into it, bouncing into my hips and changing direction. That even happens without a bounce. Moving slowly, I can feel tight, 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 tight. I get to the bottom position. All this passive tension makes it easy to change direction. Now. The fellow that was discussing this with me, we didn't disagree so much on how that was a unique scenario where that might be warranted, where that passive tension might actually be helpful. It was really more with how you generate it. Uh, I was discussing more, I've, I've done a lot about how I like the hips to be tucked under to set the hips and lower back neutral, which shortens the gluten hamstrings, shortens the abdominals, so the main movers are in a better position along the force length curve, and his, his take was that he had picked up from a lot of powerlifters is that having the hips rocked back a bit stretches the hamstring, specifically the adductor, meaning as you come down, you get tighter sooner. And he saw that passive tension as being a very good thing. And I thought, well, there's other ways to do it. You can wedge, you can wedge your knees apart to pull it tight. You can sit more into the hips to build that tension, to arbitrarily arch your back and cause all of this movement dysfunction that goes along with it. You know, going back again, the reason that I always emphasize, make sure your hips are neutral, not over tucked. So it's hard for most of you to do. Most people don't over tuck, but with you guys that have your hips that stick back like Daisy duck, if you get them neutral, immediately your glutes and hamstrings are shorter. And what did we discover? That that puts you in a stronger position along the force length curve, which means you're going to get more purchase at the bottom. Now on a squat, this is beneficial you're still gonna get passive tension as you get compression to the bottom of the squat, you will. But especially on a lift like a deadlift where you can't move into all that tension and then bounce off of it, you have to start from a dead stop, which means you're gonna be best off going with the position that puts the muscle in the strongest possible spot. And that's gonna be slightly shorter. So if we can start short and get to the bar, we're gonna have a lot more purchase. We're gonna be able to drive off a lot harder. Same is true for the bench. You know, we don't stretch the chest out. If you start with the pecs tight and you create tension as you come down, you're still getting past the tension at the bottom, but more importantly, you are dramatically increasing your ability to have active tension to drive through and build up speed at the start of a heavy bench. 
So that is my take on that. Now keep in mind, this only really has to do with optimizing performance. Developmentally, we do different things. We routinely train the muscle through a very long range of motion because it tends to be better developmentally. It's a good way to increase flexibility and to grow muscle tissue. So we're not always trying to do the most advantage thing but you have to know when that's warranted. And when you're training to get on a platform and get under the heaviest load you can, you wanna be in a position that keeps you safe, that keeps you efficient, that keeps you in one piece, and that keeps you performing for, uh, for years to come. So that's what we're looking at. So that was my uh, rant on that. So whatever questions you have, go ahead and leave them in the comments or go ahead and leave it on the forum, empire-forum.com. Thanks for watching guys, this is Alex at Empire Barbell.